Good morning. I love the energy in this room right now. I, I... 9.30 brought it this morning. Y'all are just glad to be under the AC, aren't you? <laughs> oh, man. Um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to continue to talk about the fact that God wants us to be happy. And we'll be looking at this particular book called the Book of Philippians. It was written to a church in a city called Philippi, modern-day Greece. And uh, it was written by a man named Paul who used to travel to preach the gospel and he would plant churches in the cities. And then he would follow up with letters to help them in their walk. And Paul was in jail two years later after he planted this church. And now Paul is talking about joy, even though he's behind bars. And, and, and a quick recap here. Chapter 1, Paul talks to us about the fact that you can be happy despite your circumstances. You can't let your circumstances dictate your happiness. And here's a man who is in jail, incarcerated, but refuses to let that be the definition of his life. Because he knew who he trusted in. Can you say amen? So you guys can go to my, my recap up there. Um, chapter 1 and then chapter 2, Paul says you can have happiness or joy despite people. Because you know people are fickle. Right? People, you're fickle too. So um, you can be joyful despite yourself. <laughs> Sometimes you got to put yourself aside. Be like, self, stop. I'm just going to be happy. You ever talk to yourself like that? If you don't talk to yourself, you're not living. Like once in a while, you need to tell yourself, like, man, stop it. You ever done that? You ever been like, your mind is going on that trail, you're like, stop. If you don't do that, I'm encouraging you, talk to yourself. You know, the best conversation you will ever have is with yourself sometimes. Okay, and today I want to talk to you about being happy despite things. Sometimes we get attached to things, right? And Paul, each... Each chapter is trying to give us the ingredients to be fully happy, to be truly happy, and to not let anything dictate your happiness outside of God. Can you say amen? amen. So I want to read a verse to you as we go here, but I want you to leave your Bibles open in chapter 3 because we're going to do a little Bible study here. Uh, verse 1, I just want to read the first intro verse here. It says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. I do it to safeguard your faith. Can you say amen? amen. If you're taking notes, I want to title this message, Whatever, Be Happy. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, whatever. whatever. Just be happy. Just be happy. <laughs> That's the attitude you got to have sometimes in life. I had a friend of mine in college that... To me, it was the epitome of this message. We used to call him Pink Man because he was one of those, you know, punk rock kids that had tattoos everywhere. His hair was a different color every week. And he always wore these pink pants. I mean, it takes a real man to walk around like that. <laughs> and we just called him Pink Man. And for the life of me, I'm not, gonna, I'm not joking. I can't remember his real name because we called him Pink Man, you know. And, and Pink Man had this incredible attitude about life that was, like, contagious. I remember we played soccer together on the college team. And one day we were in practice. We were just stretching, getting ready for practice. I was like, Pink Man, how, how's your day? He's like, awesome. I said, well, what was awesome about your day? He said, man, cafeteria today had the amazing sandwich. <laughs> That's the kind of guy that he was. Any little thing would just turn him on to just be happy. Another time, we're coming back from a game, and we got killed. And I mean, like, we got blown out in a soccer game. I think we lost, like, 5-1, to one, which is, like, really bad. And I'm mad because I don't take losing very well, except for yesterday. <laughs> I was really happy to take the L. I'm mad. And Pink Man says to me, that was awesome. I was like, we just got killed. What was awesome about that? He said, man, I got to play for 25 minutes straight. <laughs> Because Pink Man never played. He was, a, he, he was a bench player. He's like, y'all getting blown out. I get to play. You know, that was his attitude about life, man. He's like, man, I'm going to make the best of every situation that I had. He, I, as I was preparing this message, I kept thinking about him. And I think, and I think the key here, church, is what Paul said. Paul said, whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. That's the key. It's not just good vibes. 
Okay, positive vibes, because sometimes you say all that, you're still angry. <laughs> Good vibes, y'all. <laughs> no, it's in the Lord. It says, whatever happens, rejoice in the Lord. Right? And so you got to ask the question this morning, how do you rejoice in the Lord? Well, in order to rejoice in the Lord, you have to know the Lord. You, you have to have a relationship with the Lord. You have to know that the Lord is good, first of all. That circumstances may not be good, but God is good. You know, that people sometimes may be weird, but God is still good. Pastor Steve always taught us that when people are being weird, you be nice. You don't have to stoop down to people's levels. You know, you just can ride above it. And he said, just, he says, just let people be weird. You be you. You know, but you got to know the Lord to be able to have that focus. You know, the Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Right? That when you know the Lord, you're, you're, you're strong. When you know the Lord, situations are not going to make you cave. Right? And life is hard. We know it's challenging. But you got to rejoice not just in circumstances because they come and go. You can't rejoice in people because you know people. You can't even rejoice in yourself because you know yourself. And you can't rejoice in things because, you know, things are fleeting. So Paul says rejoice in the Lord. Can you say amen? You know, I've been thinking about this so all week. The Lord is so good. The Bible says surely goodness and mercy will follow those who love him. When you pay attention, the goodness of the Lord is all around you. is is, is in you. And is always next to you. You got to pay attention in life that the Lord never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He says, even when your family forsakes you, and he's still faithful. And he says, even when you are faithless, God still remains faithful. That's why Paul says, rejoice. (laughs) Amazing grace. How sweet the sound, right? That saved a wretch like me. These are the moments in life that we have to stop and think about his grace. Think about his goodness. Think about, just for a second, how far you've come. Because of his grace. Think about for a second how many things he has brought you through because of his grace. Think about every blessing that he has blessed you with. Think about every problem that you didn't think there was a solution and God made a way where there seems to be no way. You got to rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is for you, the Bible says. What a great statement. He says the Lord is for you. Who can be against you? When the Lord is for you. The Lord makes people even come alongside of you. The Lord is so faithful that he's not just for you. He's making a way for you. Like he goes before you, the Bible says. The Bible says he goes before you. The Bible says that he protects you. Right? That he prepares a table. uh, 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 He prepares a meal in the presence of your enemies. The Lord is not afraid of anything. The Bible says the Lord is a warrior and he fights for you. Like, you know, the warriors, hello, somebody. (laughs) Rejoice in the Lord. Church, I want to encourage you this morning to immerse yourself in the Lord. To be deep-rooted in him. Don't be rooted in circumstances. Don't be rooted in people. Don't be rooted in things. Be rooted in the Lord. How do you immerse yourself in the Lord? You have to spend time with him. You have to be curious enough to want to know him. You have to be hungry enough to say, I'm not satisfied. I need more of you, Lord. And and this is not just a Sunday morning thing. This is a lifetime of pursuing the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? The Bible says this in Psalm 126. It says, yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. What joy. It's easy to lose sight. You know, Martin Luther said something really powerful. He said that someone asked him, he said, why do you preach the gospel to us every single Sunday? He said, because every single week you seem to forget how good the Lord is. You need to be reminded that the Lord is good and he's faithful. Because we, we get thrown off by anything. Circumstances make us, you know, begin to doubt the Lord. People sometimes make us want to give up on the Lord. Things sometimes make us feel like that's what we're looking for. And those things are fleeting. And when they go, we we find ourselves in this situation where we're all confused. We're all jacked up. It's time to go back to basics and rejoice in the Lord. He's faithful. 
So in chapter 3, Paul says you got to have a spiritual mind. If you take your notes, what does he mean to have a spiritual mind? To have a spiritual mind is to think and see things from above. You have to have a different perspective. If you go in to rejoice in the Lord, you have to see things from his perspective. You know, we live in an area of drones now. And yesterday we saw some really cool pictures of this event from a drone perspective. It's different. You don't get that same view when you're on the floor, when you're on the ground level. But when you lift up, you begin to see. The Bible says, lift your eyes and see it from heaven's perspective. Because sometimes we get caught up in a little tiny perspective. We need to lift up our faith to see that God is faithful at all times. That's what it means to have spiritual mind and to have spiritual eyes. To not be attached to things. Paul talks about this. He gives you three different ways to, to focus on things that matter. I'm going to get into that in a second. But he said, listen, don't get attached to things that are tangible and don't get attached to things that are intangible. The tangible things is the material things. Jesus said, what is the point of winning the world but losing your soul? He was talking about material things. We get so attached to them, but we forget that those things are fleeting. Right? Sometimes you even get the thing you want and you're still not happy. Isn't it interesting? Sometimes we work our butt off for something and then we get there and we're like, I thought I would feel a little bit different from this. That's why the enemy is lying to people to work 60, 80 hours a week to lose their soul and to gain something that's going to be fleeting. We all have to work, but we don't have to work to the point of losing the essence of life, which is God himself. Amen. God rested. Right? He rested. And he said to you, rest. See, the word Sabbath meant for you to understand where your blessings come from. He says you need to stop to know here's where your blessings come from. Because the, the world says you got to hustle. Hustle hard. Right? But the world is empty as they're hustling hard. Like, the Bible says rest hard in the Lord. Like rest on him. Yes, you work, but know where your blessings come from. And don't get too attached to things. Learn to, to, to use things, but don't let things use you. That's good. Amen. It's amazing. Everybody's waiting for one more thing. And everybody thinks they got it coming. And that, and that is one of those clickbaits of the enemy. Always putting one more carrot in front of you. To make you lose sight of what really matters in the first place. Right? Hold things loosely. Okay? Intangible things. Paul talks about intangible things. You know what the intangible things are? Reputation. You know, positions. Fame. You know, we, we got to hold those things loosely. Because they're not what defines us. What defines us is the Lord. Right? right? So in this chapter, Paul is saying you got to lift your eyes, you got to lift your heart to have a spiritual mind to see life from above, not just from beneath. Amen. A lot of times we don't see happiness because we're looking at life just from the ground level. The Bible says you got to lift, lift your eyes to see things from above. Can you say amen? So how do we do this? Well, Paul gives us a few things here. To, to wrestle with. The first thing Paul says is, listen, if you're going to have a spiritual mind, you need to have new values. It's interesting because in this chapter, Paul kind of talks about life in three ways. He says, you got to be a good accountant, you got to be a good athlete, and then you got to be a good visionary. Are you, are you tracking with me? These are three things that Paul talks about. He says, look, you have to be a good accountant. In other words, a good accountant knows how to do math right. Paul says, well, how about you count the things that actually matter? Right? Because a lot of times you're counting things that don't matter. Right? So he begins with the intangible. He's like, listen, at one point in my life, I thought my religion was the best thing going for me. Because religion for him in that age meant status. Paul was a Pharisee, which meant he was respected. People looked up to him. And so here he's like, guys, look, the stuff that I thought matters means absolutely nothing to me because now I have a different way to account for things that matter in my life. And let me prove it to you. In verse 7 and 8, he says this about the things that I thought he thought really mattered to him. He said, well, look, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value 
of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. My friends, that's having new sets of values. That's focusing on things that, listen, that you cannot lose. The missionary Jim Elliott, a man who gave his life for the gospel, who was killed by indigenous people because they didn't understand that this man came to love him and give him the gospel. They killed him. And he's famous for saying, he says, he is no fool who, who, loses, who, who loses what he cannot keep. The gain that we take cannot lose. That's, so good. That's new sets of values. People hold on to things that they're going to lose anyways. Paul is saying, no, no, let go of those things and get a hold of the stuff that are eternal, that you can never lose in the first place, right? And that is having new sets of values. That's seeing your life from a spiritual standpoint, that careers don't define you. Positions don't define you. Reputation doesn't define you. Fame doesn't define you. Bank account doesn't define you. A car doesn't define you. A house doesn't define you. You are defined by who you are in Jesus. So all those things, yeah, they're part of life, but we hold them loosely. We hold them loosely so that when they go, we say what Paul said in chapter 4. If you keep reading, he said, listen, because I hold those things loosely, I've learned to be content. Whether I have or whether I don't, I give God the praise anyways because I know who I belong to. And I don't belong to a reputation. I don't belong to a house. I don't belong to a car. I belong to the almighty God, the, the maker of heaven and earth. So like a good accountant, you must count what matters. Once in a while, stop, look at your life and say, what really matters? Because a lot of the stuff that we're bent out of shape about don't actually matter. You know, we live in a society that's very sick physically and emotionally. And a lot of the sickness that we have is because we're holding on to things that don't matter. Amen. People have ulcers, stress, nervous breakdown because we're holding so tight to stuff that we can't take anyways. Can you say Amen. Knowing Jesus, if you take a note, is, is your ultimate possession. It's the thing that you hold that will keep you grounded and rooted in what really matters. So you must learn to let go of some of the stuff that you think matters so much. If Paul, for him, was he had to lose his religion to gain relationship. Losing my religion. Remember R.E.M.? Any 80s people in the house? You know, um, Warren Wiersbe, a great theologian, said this. He said, people who depend on religion are usually boasting about what they have done. But the true Christian has nothing to which to boast about because his boast is only in Jesus. That's when you know you've let go of some things and you're just trusting the Lord. The second thing that Paul talks about, he says, listen, you got to be a good accountant, have new sets of values, but then you got to have the mind of a great athlete to focus on what matters, he says, you got to have new vigor. In, in verses 12 to 14, look what Paul says. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things. In other words, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way, right? Or that I've already reached perfection. But I circle this word. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus, here's another key word, on this one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly price for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Can you say amen? amen. A spiritual mind. Hey, let's go ahead. Let's clap all together. Here we go. <laughs> When you have a spiritual mind, you have a focus. You press on towards those, those goals. You, you, you're, not, you're not persuaded by any trinkets. You're not persuaded by things that don't matter. That's why great athletes are so good at what they do because they have a focus. They just know, I need to run this race. Paul gives you an athlete perspective. He says, may you run the race. You ever watch the Olympics? Like the focus is intense. And they know, like, if I step on that lane that's not mine, I'm disqualified. Paul's like, man, you got to focus on running your race. 
A lot of times we, get, we disqualify ourselves because we're looking at other people's race. It's like, man, run your race, man. Focus, focus. Run your race. And press on. I love that word, press on. In other words, you're not going to be happy by coincidence or mistake. You're going to be happy because you press yourself towards happiness, towards God's will, towards his purpose. You're not going to get there by being lazy. You're going to get there by being focused. Focus. In other words, this is where I choose how I spend my energy. Every day there's many things that can suck energy out of you if you're not focused. Some people get up in the morning and they just go with the wind. <laughs> and the worst thing you can do with your energy is to get up in the morning uh, as groggy as you are to go on Facebook. You're going to get all the wrong energy in the morning. Man, get up in the morning and go to the Lord. Focus. Focus. I, I was thinking about this this week. My wife and I were talking about this. Well, we have five kids. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But we're focused on what we want to do. We made a decision before we had kids that kids are not going to determine what we do. We, following the Lord, will do everything that God calls us to do. And our kids will follow along. We're not going to stop. Because we're focused. And I'm, I'm, I'm convinced a lot of parents are using their kids as an excuse for their own complacency in life. Right? Like it blow, it, I, I, we laugh about it all the time when we hear like parents of one or two kids complain. It's like, man, please, get your game up. Have four or five, then we can talk. You ever hear parents of one kid? It's like, shut up. Try having five talking about right it's a lack of focus a kid cannot determine your life god determines your life and that kid needs to see that mom and dad are focused so they can be focused listen i want to make it clear happiness and laziness are not the same thing i know we're in the summer but it's not the same thing you can be lazy for three months, you will reap laziness for three months. Or you can have a great summer and still be productive, still be focused, still have energy. You know, he who aims at nothing hits it every single time. You bet a thousand. It's funny because that's one sin we don't talk about in the church, the sin of laziness. That's one thing that's keeping most people from their purpose is laziness. It's not drugs. It's not alcohol. Think about it. Why do people get in drugs and alcohol? Because they're lazy. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. The more idle time you have, the more you get yourself in trouble. Now, I'm not saying that's the one thing. I'm saying that's one of those things. Because it's when kids don't have absolutely nothing going on, they'll get into anything. And it's not, it's not different from, from adults. Right? If you count how many hours you spend on Facebook every week, you probably could have been a millionaire doing something productive with your life, building a business, building a focus, and doing something that will honor you and bless your kids and bless your children. Right? So happiness is focus. Happiness presses on. Right? Too many people are down in the dumps. Why? They keep looking behind. Paul says, no, I forget behind. I'm looking forward to what's ahead. Isn't that amazing? A lot of people live in the past, and then, and then they're wishful thinking about the future, but doing nothing in the present to change the fact that now I have a choice to make about what happened in the past to define a better future for myself. Ah, uh, we know, we've been talking about this. I don't want to build a church that I don't like. Just that like you shouldn't build a house you don't like. I don't like a church that's lazy. I don't like a church that makes excuses. I like a church that's active, that's thriving, that's doing things, that's pursuing things, that's believing God for bigger and better things. 
And I'm not going to sit around and make excuses because I have five kids. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. I lead by example. We're out there in the trenches every day doing whatever God calls us to do. And we're not going to make apologies for any of it because God said, be focused and get accomplished stuff. That's happiness to me. Happiness is looking back and saying, look, we did another event, and people were blessed, and people were saved, and people were restored, and we'll do it again and again. We said, we're not going to let people define what we do. God is going to define what we're going to do. And the last thing that Paul talks about here is this, man, when you, when you have spiritual mind, you have new vision. You, you have almost like an alien mindset. Can I prove it to you? Paul says, look, look, as we end today, in, in Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, look, he says this. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. New vision. When you have a spiritual mind, you know, I'm just passing through. I'm just passing through. My real home is in heaven. I'm just passing through. And you know, I love this. C.S. Lewis said this, and it's so powerful. He said, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for this present world were just those who thought the most about the next world. He said, because they knew there was a next world, they did everything they could here. To redeem things. Because they knew everything echoes in eternity. The reason why most people are not happy is because they reverse that. They live for this world. And don't do anything for the next one. And no wonder they're confused. No wonder people are in church and grumpy. Why? Because you have one foot in the world. And one foot trying to do God's will. You're never going to be fully happy if you don't embrace the fullness of God. And walk with God. C.S. Lewis goes on to say this. I love C.S. Lewis. He said, aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you get neither. That's the spiritual mind. It's focus. It's focus, people. We want to be happy. It takes focus. It takes counting the things that actually matter. Because I don't know about you, but when it's all said and done, what is it going to matter? People's opinions, who are fickle anyways. Four years ago, we had Barack Obama. Four years later, we have Trump. How does that happen if we're not fickle? How in the world do we go from that to that? Have you ever thought about that? How crazy people are. And I'm not advocating for Trump or Obama. I'm just saying how crazy we can go from one spectrum to the next in four years. Because we don't have spiritual minds. We're thinking the government is going to save us. Every four years we have a savior. <laughs> and every four years we're disappointed. Come on. Come on. Oh, we already have a savior. Amen. His name is Jesus. Yeah. My prayer this morning for us, church, have a spiritual mind. Yeah, we can spend every day at the beach. But just remember, what you're reaping is what you sow. What you sow is what you reap. Yeah, we can bypass the things of God and do whatever and, and call it good vibes and positive vibes. But just don't be surprised by what you're reaping. Just don't be surprised. And then you get mad at the people who are actually focused. Isn't it funny we get mad at those people? Why are they always posting about, you know, spiritual things? Why? Maybe they're focused. Maybe they're, they're saying, like, man, it's better for me to live my life for God than to just live by whatever feelings and emotions. Because life is unpredictable, but God is faithful. Amen. And he remains the same. Can you say amen? amen. Yes, yeah, so whatever, whatever, whatever he said, you can still be happy. Whatever the circumstances, right. you can still be happy. Why? Because you know who runs the whole thing. You know who's in control. So whatever, whatever. Every day you can get up in the morning and say whatever. Or you can make excuses. Those are the choices we have. Every day we can get up and say, whatever, Lord. 
It rained, praise the Lord. You know what's crazy? I'm Cape Verdean. I grew up in Cape Verde. I came over here when I was 15 years old. In Cape Verde, we pray for rain. Here, people curse the rain. Perspective. Because we know when it rains, we have crops, and God's blessing us. Here is, ah, oh, wow. Every time it rains, it brings me back home. And I remember, wow, this is good. That means the crops are going to be good. That means price goes down. That means everybody can eat. It's all about perspective, people. It's all about perspective. Would you stay with me as we pray this morning? Thank you, Jesus.